Grace transcends being merely a subject taught in schools or churches, it embodies the essence of our Lord Jesus Christ. An encounter with Him is nothing short of transformative, bringing liberation and profound change to lives. Unfortunately, the enemy has sown confusion and controversy around the gospel of grace, leading many to fear it and distancing them from the very source of strength they need to draw closer to God and live a victorious life that honors Him. Contrary to the claims of some, grace is not a perilous doctrine that encourages sin. My hope is that this article will clarify the true nature of grace, revealing how the person of Jesus and His grace serve as the divine power for your salvation in every aspect of life. Be aware of the risks of fake grace. We are living in remarkable times. Our Lord Jesus is actively restoring the gospel of grace first entrusted to the Apostle Paul. Over the past 10 years, I have been blessed to receive countless testimonies from individuals liberated from various addictions, including smoking, drugs, alcohol, and particularly pornography. These individuals are not only freed from the burdens of guilt and shame, their lives, marriages, and families are being renewed, and they are now living to glorify Jesus through the incredible power of His grace. Grace is not just a movement or a topic for discussion, it revolves around a person, Jesus. What one believes about our Saviour and His sacrifice on the cross is what truly matters. To understand the grace of God, it is essential we understand the difference between the old covenant of law and the new covenant of grace. John 1 verse 17 tells us, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through a servant, grace and truth came through the Son. The law talks about what man ought to be, grace reveals who God is. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6. Under the law, God demands righteousness from sinfully bankrupt men. But under grace, God provides righteousness as a gift. All who believe in Jesus and acknowledge Him as their Lord and Savior are under the new covenant of grace. Many believers today find themselves in a state of confusion. They often blend elements of the law with aspects of grace in their Christian journey. This mixture leads them to experience defeat instead of triumphing over sin through the richness of grace and the precious gift of righteousness. Romans 5 verse 17 tells us clearly that those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. When we reign in life, we reign over sin, addictions, and all forms of evil. It's heartening to see how our Lord Jesus is actively renewing the essence of the gospel of grace today, leading many to experience liberation from deep-rooted addictions and various forms of bondage. Individuals joyfully recount their miraculous journeys, sharing how they have been freed from years of substance dependency, sexual struggles, relentless panic attacks, and even prolonged clinical depression. Others express their heartfelt gratitude, celebrating the restoration of their marriages and reconnections with estranged children, as well as miraculous healings when medical professionals had lost hope. The common thread that transformed these individuals from despair to triumph, from crises to breakthroughs, is their profound encounter with our Lord Jesus and the revelation of His incredible grace. Distortions in the Restoration of God's Truth It is crucial to recognize that, similar to past restorations of God's truths throughout church history, we are currently facing distortions in the understanding of grace. Numerous controversies, inaccuracies, and imitations exist that misrepresent the authentic work of grace that God is actively performing in His church and in the lives of individuals. Sadly, a minority misinterpret the essence of God's incredible grace, using the term grace as a justification for a lifestyle that blatantly contradicts God's word. We must not base our understanding of God's grace on the actions of those who misuse it. Instead, we should delve into God's word ourselves to grasp the true, 
Antintet Gospel of Grace. As ministers, entrusted with the gospel, our duty is to stand firm in the truth of God's grace. We should heed the counsel of the Apostle Paul, who advised Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, 2 and verse 15. In this article, I aim to highlight some of the prevalent inaccuracies and counterfeit teachings surrounding grace that have led many astray. These misleading interpretations have also caused some pastors and ministers to turn away from the gospel of grace, which is truly unfortunate. My prayer is that church leaders worldwide will gain a clear revelation and understanding of the transformative good news that fosters deep relationships with our Saviour. As God-appointed shepherds, let us refrain from making judgments based on incomplete snippets and rumours, and instead, thoroughly investigate what each grace preacher is teaching, ensuring it aligns with Scripture. Is grace a license to sin? Due to the misinterpretations and misuse of the concept of true grace, I've often heard people cautioning others, be wary of that dangerous grace teaching, it allows people to sin. If you come across any teaching that claims grace permits sinning, encourages a life devoid of respect for the Lord, or suggests that sin carries no repercussions, my strong recommendation is to steer clear of such teachings. What you've encountered is a false version of grace. Authentic grace instructs believers in Christ to pursue a life of holiness, integrity, and accountability. It emphasizes that sin inevitably leads to harmful outcomes and that true liberation from the grip of sin is only attainable through the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Titus 2 verse 11 to 15 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. The scriptures clearly indicate that God's grace instructs us, to reject ungodliness and embrace a life of righteousness. Therefore, be cautious of misleading teachings about grace that go against biblical principles. So, how can we discern if someone is genuinely living in God's grace? We examine their actions. If an individual is abandoning his wife for his secretary and claims to be living under grace, remind him that he is not experiencing true grace, but rather living in deception. Rely on the authority of God's word rather than his claims. Romans 6 verse 14 tells us, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. If this person were genuinely under grace, he would not be enslaved by such sin. Moreover, no one who is living in sin can rightfully use grace as a justification for their actions, as it stands in stark contrast to God's holy teachings. True grace does not serve as a permit to sin. Instead, it empowers us to rise above sin's control. Authentic grace does not lower God's standards or excuse wrongdoing. It provides the strength to lead vibrant lives dedicated to good deeds. There will always be a few individuals who misuse grace, creating discord with misleading teachings and living in ways that fail to honour the Lord. So, how should we respond? Should we retreat from sharing the true message of God's grace due to these controversies and misuses? Absolutely not. I encourage you today, echoing the words of Titus, to speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. In essence, we must not shy away from proclaiming God's grace. On the contrary, 
We should intensify our commitment to sharing the authentic gospel, which calls everyone to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The more we promote true grace, the more we can diminish the influence of counterfeit teachings. Many may freely label themselves as grace preachers, elite grace ministries and grace churches. However, we must exercise discernment. Just because they claim to preach grace doesn't guarantee they are faithfully representing the gospel. Scrutinize everything. Ensure that their stance on sin is unmistakable, as sin is harmful and carries a multitude of negative consequences. True grace doesn't disregard the moral excellencies of the Ten Commandments. There have been many inaccurate explanations about the Ten Commandments in counterfeit grace teachings. Be clear that true grace teaches that the Ten Commandments are holy, just, and good. True grace teaching upholds the moral excellencies, values, and virtues espoused by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are so perfect in its standard and so unbending in its holy requirements that Galatians 3 verse 11 states that no man can be justified by the law in the sight of God. Justification before God can only come by faith in Christ. The Ten Commandments are glorious. The problem has never been the Ten Commandments or God's perfect law. The challenge has always been humanity's struggle to adhere to God's flawless law. According to the terms of the Mosaic Covenant, obedience to God's law brought blessings, while disobedience resulted in curses and a looming death sentence. The reality is that under the Old Covenant, no one could fulfill the law perfectly. This is why, shortly after the law was established, God instituted a system of animal sacrifices, allowing the burdens of curse, condemnation, and death to be transferred to a sacrificial bull or lamb. This foreshadows Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. When John the Baptist encountered Jesus by the Jordan River, he proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world John 1 verse 29. Thus, even within the law, we recognize that Christ is humanity's only hope for reconciliation with God. Genuine teachings of grace honor the moral standards of the law, while also clarifying that no one can achieve justification through the Ten Commandments, highlighting our need for Christ. True grace enables us to exceed the law's demands. Throughout the 1,500 years that God's people adhered to the law, no one, except for our Lord Jesus, was able to perfectly obey the Ten Commandments and achieve justification. Pay close attention to this important truth. When we embrace the love of our Lord Jesus under grace, we naturally fulfill the law. Genuine grace leads us to true holiness. As the Apostle Paul boldly stated, Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 13 verse 10. When Jesus' love fills our hearts, fulfilling the law becomes second nature. With our hearts brimming with God's grace and kindness, we lose the inclination to commit adultery, murder, bear false witness, or covet. This transformative power to love our neighbors as ourselves stems from being deeply rooted in God's grace. We are empowered to love because He first loved us. The reality is that when God's people live under grace, they not only adhere to the law but also surpass its requirements. The law instructs us not to commit adultery, and while some may follow this rule outwardly, they may lack genuine love for their spouses. Grace transforms this dynamic. It goes beyond mere compliance, teaching us to love our partners as Christ loved the church. Similarly, while the law may prohibit coveting, it cannot inspire us to be joyful givers. God's grace reaches deeper, transforming our hearts from covetousness to love, compassion, and generosity. Consider the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. No commandments were issued, yet when the love and grace of our Lord Jesus touched his heart, 
this once greedy tax collector, was moved to give half of his wealth to the poor and repay fourfold everyone he had wronged. The rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18 approached Jesus with confidence, claiming he had adhered to all the commandments. He likely anticipated praise from Jesus for his adherence to the law, feeling quite self-assured. However, Jesus responded differently. Instead of offering compliments, he pointed out, one thing you still lack, Luke 18 verse 22. This illustrates that whenever we take pride in our ability to follow the law, Jesus will highlight an area where we fall short. He instructed the young man to sell all his possessions, give to the poor, and follow him, emphasizing the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, which includes not placing money above him. The outcome? The young ruler, left in sorrow, unable to part with even a single dollar. The juxtaposition of these two narratives in Luke 18 and 19 serves to reveal the contrast between the emptiness of boasting in the law and the transformative power of the Lord's unconditional grace in people's lives. Embrace growth from glory to glory without the veil. God's grace complements the perfect and glorious law of the Ten Commandments. The Apostle Paul expresses this sentiment when he states, For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, Romans 7 verse 22. Yet, he also acknowledges a struggle, saying, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, to the law of sin, which is in my members, Romans 7 verse 23. This highlights that while the law of God is holy, just, and good, it lacks the power to make us holy, just, and good. Paul says in Romans 7. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. The law itself is holy, and its command are holy and right and good. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. We discover through Paul that merging God's flawless law with our sinful nature does not lead to holiness. Instead, as Paul points out, it results in a life ensnared by sin, condemnation, and death. There is nothing good within our human nature, and as long as we inhabit this earthly body, the sinful tendencies within us will persist. However, we can rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ, for this does not have to culminate in despair and hopelessness. Thanks to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the barrier of the law can be lifted, allowing us to encounter Jesus directly and experience a magnificent transformation. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 11, 14, and 18 So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever, but the people's minds were hardened, and to this day whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him, as we are changed into His glorious image. The Scriptures clearly indicate that the law ignites our sinful tendencies, while grace fosters genuine holiness. Holiness involves a deepening resemblance to Jesus, which occurs when the constraints of the law are lifted. Once the veil is taken away, we encounter our magnificent Saviour directly, and His radiant grace changes us progressively. The magnificent message of grace consistently leads to remarkable lives. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, 
we will evolve from one level of glory to another, shining brightly as a reflection of the Lord's goodness and moral perfection. Grace does not equate to universal salvation. When Jesus Christ sacrificed himself at Calvary, he bore the weight of humanity's sins in a single, profound act. He accepted the judgment, punishment, and condemnation for every wrongdoing, showcasing the immense worth of one man, Jesus. His sacrifice is more than sufficient to cover all our transgressions. But does this imply that everyone is automatically forgiven and saved? Absolutely not. While the sins of all were addressed at Calvary, each person must make a conscious choice to accept forgiveness by embracing Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Any teaching that suggests otherwise is a distortion of true grace. Salvation can only be found through Jesus and His sacrificial blood. God's Word says. Romans 10 verse 9 to 13. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The scriptures are clear and unambiguous about how one becomes a born-again believer in Christ. To attain salvation, it is essential to openly declare that Jesus is your Lord and to genuinely believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. If any teacher of grace suggests that you can be saved without accepting Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, claiming there are other paths, they are misrepresenting the truth of Scripture. Jesus is the sole path to salvation. Without Him, there is no salvation. The cleansing blood of Jesus is necessary for forgiveness, and without His resurrection, we cannot have assurance that our sins are forgiven. Salvation is exclusively found in Jesus. I also recognize that some preach a distorted version of grace, asserting that ultimately everyone, including Satan and his fallen angels, will be saved. They deny the reality of hell as a place of eternal punishment, taking an extreme view of God's love while neglecting His righteousness and judgment. This perspective contradicts the clear teachings of Scripture regarding eternal separation for the unsaved. This is not the true gospel of grace. Are only our past sins forgiven? Returning to the topic of sin forgiveness, the authentic gospel reveals that when we invite Jesus into our hearts and acknowledge Him as our Lord and Saviour, all our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. To grasp the concept of total forgiveness, we must appreciate the immense value of the one who sacrificed himself for us on the cross. Only Jesus, the sinless Son of God, could atone for the sins of every person with a single, perfect sacrifice. However, some teachings imply that upon receiving Jesus, only our past sins are forgiven, while future sins are forgiven as we confess them. This notion directly contradicts Scripture, as we will explore further. Ephesians 1 verse 7 states, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. In the original Greek text, the verb for have is in the present tense, which indicates durative action, meaning we are continually having forgiveness of sins, including every sin we will ever commit. Point 1. 1 John 2 verse 12 says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. The Greek perfect tense is used here for are forgiven, meaning this forgiveness is a definite action completed in the past, with the effect continuing into the present point too. This means that God's forgiveness avails for us in our present and continues into our future. Let me give you another clear scripture that states that all our sins, including our future sins, have been forgiven. 
Colossians 2 verse 13 to 14. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Jesus has forgiven all our sins. The term all in this context comes from the Greek word pa, which signifies every kind of variety, the totality of the persons or things referred to. It encompasses all, any, every, the whole. Therefore, all truly means all. God's forgiveness extends to every sin, whether in the past, present, or future. When we accepted the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we embrace the complete and total forgiveness of all our sins. As ministers of God, our mission is to instill in our congregations the unwavering assurance of their salvation and forgiveness found in Christ. We are not called to deliver a mixed message that breeds insecurity and doubt, leaving individuals questioning their forgiveness and the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The assurance of salvation and the complete forgiveness of sins are the bedrock of the good news we proclaim. I propose that this understanding of God's forgiveness does not encourage a life of recklessness. Jesus taught that those who are forgiven much will love Him deeply. Conversely, those who believe they have been forgiven little, though in reality, no one falls into that category, since we have all been forgiven much, will only love him a little. My hope is that everyone who hears us share the true gospel of grace will grasp the fullness of God's forgiveness available to those who accept his Son, Jesus Christ. This understanding will undoubtedly lead them to a deeper love for Jesus and inspire a life filled with praise, honor, and glory to Him. What about the confession of sins? When I preach that all our sins have been forgiven and that we are perpetually under the fountain of the ever-cleansing blood of Jesus, another question I'm often asked is, what about the confession of sins spoken of in 1 John 1 verse 9? The verse says clearly, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't we have to confess our sins in order to be forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness? You're looking at someone who fully embraced the traditional interpretation of this verse. As a young adult eager to lead a holy life and please God, I took to confessing my sins at every opportunity after receiving that teaching. I was determined not to spend a single moment out of alignment with God. So, whenever a stray negative thought entered my mind, I would immediately whisper my confession, even if I was in the midst of a soccer game with my friends. Unsurprisingly, my behavior struck my friends as odd. I was also confused as to why my fellow Christians didn't seem to share my urgency in confessing their sins. Why weren't they as committed to being completely right with God? This relentless cycle of confession made me hyper-aware of my sins. I became so fixated on every negative thought that I started to feel there was no forgiveness left for me. I even feared that I had lost my salvation and was destined for hell. The enemy exploited my fixation on confessing every sin leaving me in a state of constant condemnation. The weight of it all became so overwhelming that I felt like I was on the brink of losing my mind. The opening chapter of 1 John was directed, not at believers, but at Gnostics, who denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. This is evident in the unusual introduction of John's first epistle, which lacks the customary greeting found in his second and third letters. Instead, John confronts the Gnostic heresy head-on, stating, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, 1 John 1 verse 1. Through this, John affirms that Jesus was indeed incarnate, as he and his fellow disciples had both witnessed and interacted with him. It isn't until chapter 2 that John uses the term, my little children, signaling a shift in his audience to believers. 
The Gnostics also claimed to be without sin, prompting John to urge them to acknowledge and confess their sins, assuring them that God would forgive and purify them from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1 verses 8-9. Interestingly, the early Christians did not have access to the book of 1 John for about 50 years, meaning their reconciliation with God could not have relied on the confession of sins. The Apostle Paul, who authored a significant portion of the New Testament, never instructed believers to confess their sins for reconciliation. In his letter to the Corinthians, many of whom were engaging in sinful behaviors, he did not advise them to confess, but instead reminded them of their identity in Christ, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 Ultimately, our standing with God is not contingent upon the flawed confessions of imperfect individuals, but rests on the abundant grace of God and the flawless sacrifice of His Son. Those who interpret 1 John 1 verse 9 as a directive for believers to confess every single sin they commit should consider that all sins must be acknowledged and confessed, otherwise, according to that verse, one remains unrighteous. It's not feasible to selectively confess only the sins you can recall. In fact, it's humanly impossible to account for every sin in thought, word, and action. The term confess in 1 John 1 verse 9 comes from the Greek word homologio, which translates to, to say the same thing, as, or, to agree with. Thus, confessing our sins means, aligning our understanding of our sins with God's perspective, recognizing them as sin and acknowledging that they have been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 verse 5 When we realize we have sinned, true confession involves agreeing with God's word and expressing gratitude for the forgiveness we have in Christ. To the theologians among us, I want to share a profound insight that the Lord has revealed to me. During my studies, he prompted me to investigate the term sins in 1 John 1 verse 9 to determine whether it is used as a noun or a verb in the original Greek. Are you prepared for this discovery? In both occurrences of the word sins, in 1 John 1 verse 9, the Greek noun hemasha is employed. Renowned Bible scholar William Vine describes hemasha as a missing of the mark, which signifies a principle or source of action, or an inward element producing X, a governing principle or power. This indicates that it refers to the principle of sin, or our sinful nature, stemming from Adam's transgression. By using the noun form, John was clearly not addressing individual acts of sin. Had he intended that, he would have chosen the verb form, homatano. With this understanding, it becomes clear that 1 John 1 verse 9 is not instructing us to confess every sin we commit in thought or action. Instead, John emphasizes the importance of acknowledging and confessing to God that we are sinners due to Adam's sin, while also embracing the complete forgiveness available for all our sins through Jesus. How often do we need to do this? Only once. This is why 1 John 1 verse 9 serves as a key verse for salvation, urging sinners to recognize and confess their sinful nature, or sinnerhood, and to be reborn through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It emphasizes the transformation from a sinful state inherited from Adam to a new righteous state through Christ. The Gnostic heresy denied the existence of man's sinful condition, and John directly confronted this false teaching in the first chapter of 1 John, encouraging Gnostics to admit their sins and accept the Lord's complete forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness through His redemptive work on the cross. So, what does the Apostle John convey about sinning after we become believers? Just two verses later, in 1 John 2, he addresses this concern, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous 1 John 2 verse 1. In this context, the terms sin and sins derive from the Greek verb homatano, 
which refers to the sins committed by believers, those sinful thoughts and actions. John reassures us that when we stumble, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Thanks to our Lord Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross, we are granted forgiveness and maintain our righteous standing before God, even in our failures. Just as the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian believers of their identity as the temple of the Holy Spirit, John reinforces our identity in Christ and the fact that we have Jesus representing us at God's right hand. The Bible consistently emphasizes that the key to overcoming sin lies in reminding believers of their righteous identity in Christ. This message is not meant to promote sinning, but rather to direct a focus toward our Lord Jesus, where we can witness our sins being dealt with at the cross. It encourages us to live victoriously and gloriously for Him. True repentance involves turning to the cross and embracing His grace. When you stumble today, remember that you can approach God with honesty about your shortcomings, or while keeping the revelation of the cross in mind. Acknowledge that your sins were borne by His body, and allow yourself to receive His forgiveness and unearned grace to triumph over your sins. Do we confess our sins under grace? During my time preaching in Italy, I had a poignant conversation with a well-known psychiatrist I had just met. He revealed to me a troubling reality. He had worked with many earnest Christians who were living in defeat, some even confined to mental institutions, all because they felt their standing with God depended on their ability to confess every single sin. Can you grasp the peril of this belief? Lacking the assurance of complete forgiveness, these individuals are consumed by guilt and shame, tormented by their enemy, devoid of joy, and deeply insecure about their salvation. The reality, however, is that every believer enjoys total forgiveness through Christ, whose eternal sacrifice continually cleanses them from all sin. Once they embrace this truth, their souls are filled with heavenly peace, much like Francis Havogol, the renowned hymn writer from the 19th century. The transformation this brings is not a reckless urge to sin, but rather a profound desire to honor their Savior. Those who understand the depth of their forgiveness, truly forgiven of all, will love deeply. We confess our sins knowing we are already forgiven, not to be forgiven. Is Joseph Prince opposed to Christians confessing their sins? Let me clarify, I firmly believe in the importance of confessing sins, and I still do so. However, my perspective has shifted, I now confess my sins with the understanding that they are already forgiven. I don't confess to earn forgiveness. Because I share a close relationship with my Heavenly Father, I can openly admit my wrongdoings. I can discuss my shortcomings with Him, receive His grace for my weaknesses, and move forward, fully aware that His Son's sacrifice has already secured my forgiveness. I no longer stress about the impossibility of confessing every single sin, as I recognize that my salvation is not based on my confessions, but on the blood of Jesus. Beloved, our forgiveness was fully secured by the precious blood of our Lord. It does not depend on our ability to confess every sin perfectly. How could our forgiveness hinge on the consistency, frequency, or quality of our confessions? That approach is destined to fail. Our forgiveness relies on our faith in the power of our Lord's sinless blood shed on the cross. Understanding this distinction in the foundation of our forgiveness brings a profound difference to our peace of mind. Dear reader, grace does not trivialize sin, it empowers us to overcome it. This is the truth of grace that God desires us to embrace 2 Peter 1 verse 12, we confess our sins because we are already forgiven, not in order to receive God's forgiveness. The more aware you are of your forgiveness in Christ, the more you will rise above every challenge. True grace promotes ongoing sanctification. I recognize that some ministers genuinely fear that presenting the gospel in its fullness might lead individuals 
to exploit their complete forgiveness in Christ, resulting in lives devoid of godliness. They worry that such teachings neglect the importance of sanctification and the aspiration to lead holy, God-honoring lives. However, this concern stems from a misunderstanding, as true grace indeed advocates for progressive sanctification. It's important to clarify that while a believer is justified and made righteous through the blood of Jesus, sanctification is a continuous journey in their Christian walk. This is why the author of Hebrews notes that we are being sanctified even though we have been perfected forever through Christ's singular act of obedience on the cross Hebrews 10 verse 14. As followers of Christ, we may not increase our righteousness, but we can certainly grow in our sanctification and holiness through our daily lives. The moment we place our faith in Jesus, we experience justification by faith. We were instantly forgiven, cleansed, perfected in righteousness, and saved. Additionally, we were sanctified in Christ Hebrews 10 verse 10. However, it's crucial to recognize that the realization and manifestation of our sanctification in Christ unfolds over time. This means that as we deepen our relationship with the Lord Jesus, we will increasingly reflect holiness in all aspects of our lives. The scriptures affirm that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. Therefore, we must be cautious of any misleading teachings on grace that suggest behavior, discipline, correction, and righteous living are unimportant. The understanding of forgiveness does not undermine the necessity of right living, rather, it serves as the driving force behind it. According to Merriam-Webster Online, sanctification is defined as the state of growing in divine grace as a result of Christian commitment after conversion. It's fundamentally about maturing in grace. We should motivate our communities to root themselves in the gospel of grace. Paul urged Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2 verse 1. Similarly, Peter encouraged believers to lay a solid foundation with his final words in his last letter, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3 verse 18. True grace always produces true holiness. As one deepens in grace, continuously refreshed by the living water of God's Word, there is a corresponding growth in sanctification and holiness. When individuals truly encounter the grace of our Lord Jesus, the temptations and fleeting pleasures of sin diminish in the brilliance of His glory and grace. This transformation empowers them to triumph over sin's hold. Let's embrace the gospel boldly. I hope this article serves as a guide for pastors, ministers, and church leaders to embark on a journey of distinguishing between authentic grace and its imitations. Many insights shared here are drawn from my book, Grace Revolution, Experience the Power to Live Above Defeat, where these concepts are explored in greater detail. I urge you, as a fellow believer, to stand firm in the gospel of grace, undeterred by rumors, misleading teachings, controversies, or the actions of a few who misrepresent the gospel through their lives. The gospel of grace is the solution. It elevates those ensnared by sin from a cycle of defeat. True grace fosters a lasting holiness that emerges from a heart transformed by an encounter with Jesus, rather than a superficial display of righteousness. It's possible that we aren't bringing people to faith as effectively as we could because we've unintentionally mixed the message of Christ with our own efforts. While good deeds are a natural outcome of true salvation, they should never be seen as a prerequisite for it. Genuine moral transformation occurs when we understand that we are saved by grace through faith, not the other way around. The flood of testimonies we receive each week about lives transformed from sin, addiction, and various struggles 
is a testament to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ being shared. Let's strive to be faithful messengers of the authentic gospel of grace that truly transforms lives.